Okay, today's going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to sit, um, right? It's weird. Um, this is just a conversation, and sometimes I ask you guys to come in to take notes because when you take notes, you remember better, and you enter more deeply into what the Word of God is saying. Um, today, I don't want you to take notes, so if you're already ready, put them away, um, the reason is, is because I want you to fully go there uh, on what we've got to talk about today. Um, so, and distraction is some of the reason that we haven't gone there in the past. So I want to go there. Um, a lot of today, too, it's going to be maybe a little bit less on the Bible verses um, we're going to see what the scripture has to say, but we're not going to spend time in a large passage of scripture today. Um, there's a lot that I want to share, and, and the disclaimer is a lot of this uh, that I'm going to share today is my understanding of the process of grief based on where I'm at in my life right now. And so I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say with that. Um, every time I've lost someone who was more and more important to me, the more I realized, oh, I thought I understood grief and now I understand it more. Oh, I thought I knew what loss really was and now I understand it so much more deeply because now I've gone through this. And some of you guys have had that experience. Um, so I'm gonna give you what I have um, up to this point. Um, I'll start with a dumb illustration. I hurt my finger. I feel like a little kid. I hurt my finger. Um, I hurt my finger. Um, so <laughs> I was trying to be fancy. Um, I, I was on my miter saw uh, about three weeks ago, and, and it, the, the blade wasn't involved. It's okay. Um, but I was trying to shave some bark off of a tree limb, and it was just the wood was too dense, and the, the, the blade grabbed it and smacked the piece of wood against my finger, against the table, and, and it was a bloody mess. So all the gross stuff is out of the way. Um, but for a time... Um, you know, this was bandaged up and it was angry and it was swollen and it was bleeding too much. And, and, um, there were all kinds of problems with it. When you're in that first phase, right? Like when the pain is really acute and things are really a problem, um, you tend to know that there's a problem, number one, and you tend to treat the thing very, very carefully. And then healing starts. Yes. Healing starts. And when healing starts, the swelling goes down and the pain isn't so acute. And sometimes in that second phase of healing, we can, we can fool ourselves into thinking this means it's healed. It doesn't mean it's healed. Um, and so then you do stupid stuff like I did yesterday and I was hanging Christmas lights in our front yard tree and, and I kept smacking it against tree branches and like, why does this hurt? Yeah. <laughs> because it's not fully healed yet. And I think the same as a, a mo or a physical pain, it's with emotional pain. Um, sometimes we go through a loss. You've gone through a loss. I've gone through a loss. And, you know, in those first weeks and months, it's like everything's swollen and angry and, and difficult. And, and we all know and we're all doing the thing. Um, and people know how to deal with us maybe. And, but then you go through this phase where some healing starts to happen and you kind of think it should be over now, right? And then you know it's not over because the pain is still there. And sometimes people treat you like the pain should be over. Aren't you over it yet? I'm not sure that's helpful, right? It's not. Um, and so we've got to be careful to understand all of that. So this is me trying to stir this up. Because the holidays stir it up, don't they? Part of the reason we're talking about it today is we knew we were going into Christmas, and Christmas has a way of taking that thing that used to be acute, and it kind of triggers us a bit and stirs the emotions up, and all of a sudden we find ourselves feeling things because that person who used to make that recipe every single year all of a sudden isn't here, and Christmas isn't going to be the same. We're going to show up to this party, and, and we all, always knew they laughed this way at that joke, and we're going to miss them. We're going to miss them. And that missing is a precious and holy thing, but it's a painful thing. And sometimes we don't want to talk about it or we want to avoid it. So, um, yeah. 
I want you to be okay and ready for Christmas as much as you possibly can be. We get stirred up. Uh, here's kind of a simple idea. If there's still pain, you still have healing to do. If there's still pain, you still have healing to do. Um, it may be that God is going to do the healing in you. It may be that he's going to give you steps to take for that healing to happen. But in the physical realm, the emotional realm, if there's pain, don't question it. Just realize there's more healing to do. So that's the first thing. Um, you might go through today and realize that there was a hidden wound that you walked in this morning and didn't really realize that was there. By the time we get to the end of this message, we may have stirred some things up. That's okay. Um, it may be that what you're dealing with isn't just a loss of a loved one through a death in your life. It could be that the struggle that you've had, the loss that you feel is... Um, Maybe it's the loss of a marriage or it's the loss of a family. And so you're going to go into the holidays and that's the loss you're feeling or you've gone through a life event that's very difficult, could be a cancer, could be something else. And what you've lost is that old way of life that you used to live, that used to feel normal. And then people come along to you and say, you know, you've got to learn a new normal right now. And then you want to smack them, right? Right? or choke them very tenderly in a Christian way. Just bring me your neck for just a second. That's all I need. Um, it just, right? And may, this may be part of the process, but I, maybe I'm not ready to face it. Anyway, um, this may apply to you in a lot of different ways. If there's still pain, you still have healing to do. So here's a verse. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. This is the Apostle Paul talking to some Christians, to a church. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. And I, I love that Paul comes in and says, you know what? We're supposed to grieve but we grieve like those who have hope. Don't grieve like those who have no hope. Like, like God's given us the truth. He's given us theology. And sometimes theology feels like it belongs in a book. But Christian theology, truth about God, is meant to come into our daily lives. It's supposed to help us in our life. And so Paul comes and takes a bit of theology and says, this is supposed to be an anchor for you. See, Jesus rose from the dead, not just for himself, not just for a great miracle, and it's a great miracle, but Jesus rose from the dead so that we would have hope that we will rise from the dead, so that we will have hope that our loved ones who we have lost, they will rise. If they are in Christ, they will rise. And so he says, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. We grieve but with hope, and it's those two points. So if you grew up in a church or in a family that says good Christians who have actual faith stop crying, that's wrong. Now, grieving, mourning is part of it, and Paul acknowledges that here. No, mourn and cry, but mourn and cry with hope. So there's truth and there's faith. The faith is we trust God in the dark just like we trusted him in the daytime. And in the midst of our loss, it feels like all the lights have gone out. And that's when we really have to trust him, yes? Yeah, so it's a choice that we make. Now, how do we do this? How do we, how do we grieve like those who have hope? That's a big question. Practically speaking, how do we do it? I think before we get into how we do it, I think we should acknowledge how we often do it wrong in an unhealthy way. So there's four ways I think that we sometimes uh, do grieving wrong. Sometimes we find ourselves denying is the first one. We find ourselves denying what has happened. We don't talk about it. We avoid the pain. We say things like, I've just got to be strong. And usually we say something very responsible, like, I've got to be strong for them. And, and, and what that is, is I'm going to embrace strength instead of weakness. I'm not going to be vulnerable, and, and we deny. 
and that's not helpful. It's not helpful because there's no truth in it. Like, God will always lead you to a place that's full of truth. God will never lead you into fantasy land. And so you got to have truth and then faith. Um, I was talking to a soldier this week about this topic and saying, hey, would you just like tell me some things about the soldier experience uh, when it comes to grief and some things that maybe I should know and be sensitive to and um, they were really great about it, and they said, you know, one of the things that's unique to soldiers is that um, when they go through loss, they often go through it very young. They're very early in their life, and that many people, when they experience their first real loss in their life, they tend to be older, and they've got more emotional uh, maturity, and they've got more tools to work through it, but for soldiers, it often happens when they're very, very young. It's a challenge. The other challenge he said that soldiers tend to go through is that um, just part of the DNA of the whole soldier experience is that when you walk into a room, you want to be the toughest person in the room. And grieving doesn't really work with that. So this denying thing becomes an easy go-to. It's tough to do the other, but you need truth and you need healing. The second thing that we sometimes do is we detach. So we're detaching And by detaching, I mean we're isolating ourselves from others and we're isolating ourselves from community, from that support system that would help us walk through this grief better. And so any of the activities that we would go to, we tend to pull back from those activities, right? Because we know that if we go to those activities with people that know us, they're going to ask us about the thing that we're feeling. And that's really risky and a struggle, and we're not sure that we want to face that. And so we back off and we isolate, and sometimes we, we take what, um, the, you know, that bucket of emotions, and we want to pre-fill the bucket so that pain doesn't come in. And so we'll, we'll do entertainment, or, or we'll pour ourselves into our work. We'll, we'll shove everything we can into that bucket of emotions so that we don't have to feel the pain that's there. Make sense? Again, there's, there's no truth in that because it's all going to be waiting for us when we get to the other side. Um, when my dad died, he died um, this February. It'll be four years ago. He and I were close. It was a big loss in my life for me. Um, Jake felt it as well, my oldest. Um, and he would do this thing. I, I would be in the kitchen, and Jake would come walking into the kitchen, and he would be like, okay, dad, how are you? Like, for real, how are you? And I wanted to kill him, right? Like, what are you doing to me right now? Like, you really want me to stop? You really want me to feel all this? You really want me to talk about all this? And all that stuff that comes up in your throat and just sits right there and you don't want to let it out, right? Why? Because I would be weak. I would be overwhelmed. I'd be unable to handle everything that's down here. And so, yeah, I don't even remember what I used to do to him. (laughs) Ignored him, walked away, gave him a quick answer. The fourth thing that we do is we, um, we find ourselves drowning Draining and drowning. And this is, this is kind of a, a more deceptive one that we find ourselves in because it's based on truth, yes? Like, like we're, we're about the truth that we've lost this person. We're feeling the feelings. Life's never gonna be the same. This is very, very difficult on us. And we so focus and fixate on that truth that we shove out the hope. And we find ourselves despairing and drowning in the midst of it. And it's, it becomes our whole world, our whole view Um, and it gets us because it's got some truth in it. It just doesn't have faith. So those are the things that we sometimes find ourselves doing. Do you see yourself in any of them? All of them? I see myself in all of them, different times. So what do we do instead? So instead of denying, we need to face it. Um, Ecclesiastes 7, 2, I love this verse. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. So the verse says, go there. I love that. Like, you want to go to a party, I get it. But sometimes you got to go to the house of mourning. 
Go to the funeral. Like, like this verse means so much. Like, it, it means if you're part of a church community where someone else is suffering, you go to the funeral. Right? You go because they need you. Like, that's one thing. The other thing, it says go because there's perspective there about how short life is about eternity is in view. And eternity isn't just, again, it's not information and it's not logical in a book. It's right in front of you. And so it changes you. But the other reason it says go to the house of mourning is because sometimes we don't want to. It says go there. You need it. Face the pain and drive into it intentionally. And it's a choice. Um, when my grandmother, uh, Betty Zimmerman, passed away, Jake had just been born, and um, it was October that she died, and you're going right into Christmas, and this is my grandma, um, old German grandma, wonderful Betty. She had the greatest laugh ever, and um, the problem with going into Christmas is that Betty Zimmerman had all the recipes, and she made everything. We were going to starve. And you knew everything that she would do on that day, right? Because sometimes Christmas Day is like a play and we all know our parts to play. We step onto the stage and we do the whole thing, right? And it's like all of a sudden somebody's missing and we're going to feel that. And we're all going to feel it. Yeah, so we, we got there that day and somehow the food got made by somebody else. And, and we're, we sat down to pray and we got in a circle as a family and... Um, one of us said, hey, before we pray, somebody needs to say something about grandma. And all of a sudden, somebody came out with a story, and they're telling a story. And all of a sudden, the story went funny, and we were laughing at her. And then somebody else shared a story, and we're laughing and we're crying. And then another story got shared, and then another story got shared. And it just, it all went around there. And then we prayed, and it was this most beautiful moment because what we didn't realize what we were about to do in our fear and in our pain is we were about to shove her down into a drawer. And instead, what we ended up doing, thank God, is we honored her and we brought her in and it was like she was in the room with us. And it was just so good. You got to face it. I should have done better with Jake when he came into the kitchen. I should have faced it. Next, mourning is letting others in, not detaching. Romans 12, 15, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Um, we need to cry our tears with others is what the scripture is saying here. Weep with those who weep. This is all about community. This is... This is uh, this is mourning with family. Um, we're so tempted to go into a room ourselves and we can't do it. Why? Um, when you mourn, you share the burden with somebody else, yes? Uh, they bring sunlight, they bring truth, they bring love into your mourning. When you're alone, it's just you in the dark. You gotta let others in. Weep with those who weep. Jesus did this. You remember the story with Mary and Martha and Lazarus had died and he shows up? The Lord of the universe shows up. And when he does, he sees them crying and he doesn't give them a theological story or, or teaching or whatever. He cries with them. It's amazing. And he shares it with them. He carries it with them. And I love that. Um, when I lost my dad, which was just a, a wholesale different kind of loss than I had experienced up to that point, I started noticing everybody around me who had also lost someone important to them. <clears throat> you ever buy a car and all of a sudden you notice that car everywhere that you go? It's like dumb human thing, right? Like when you experience that kind of loss, you start noticing everybody else who's experienced great loss. And you start entering in with them just a little bit more than you had before. And you start asking them about things. And I remember sitting down with a friend, her name was Kelly, and her dad had died the year before mine had died. And, <clears throat> um, and so all of a sudden, I started talking to her about this. And, and she's like, yeah, people stop asking. And I'm like, well, the reason I stopped asking is because I didn't want to be the person who stirred it up in you. 
like you were going along your merry way all at peace and all of a sudden I ask you about this painful topic and she's like, nope, that's a misunderstanding. I'm always feeling it. You're just being kind. I had to experience that to know what she was saying was true. Always ask because you're entering in and you're sharing it with them. Always ask, even months or years later. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. Mourning is crying the tears that God gives you. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. There's so much truth in that. Do you know there's a time to weep? But there's also a season when the weeping stops. Right? Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning, is in the Psalms, right? Where are you at, second service? Can I get an amen? amen? There you are. All right. So uh, mourning will change over time as we heal. Um, those of you that are drowning and sinking in your despair, just realize the truth of God's word would come in and say, you're not meant to stay in that place forever. Please hear that. Uh, the second thing to hear is that you need to, tr to cry those tears. Um, cry them. Why? Because uh, God ordained them for you. God gave them to you. This is a point of faith. This is a choice that you make. I'm not going to hold them back. I'm going to feel them. I'm going to drive into this. I'm going to step into this. Uh, when Jake walks into the kitchen with you next time, you're actually going to tell him how you feel. Even if that means they come all the way up out of your mouth, right? And you vomit all the stuff out in front of him. Guess what happens when you do that? You speak a truth. You, your tears speak a truth to that person. It speaks a truth that I am unable to cope with what I'm carrying right now. I'm unable to handle it. And so it's pouring out in this way. Oh, that's tough. You're like, but I'm the strong one. Time to be weak. Time to allow yourself to be weak. Time, time, to, time to respect what God has given you and to say, you are going to be strong and I am weak today. You are God and I am not today. Right? Like I'm going to let that happen. And, and chances are the Jakes of this world need to see that from you. We all need to have our moments out of control. The Lord has tears for you to cry. Respect them, cry them, feel them. 1 Peter 5, 7. Mourning is giving our pain to God. 1 Peter 5, 7. Give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. That phrase is absolutely beautiful, but it's really infuriating also. Because people will say things to you, especially in the Christian community like this all the time. Just give it to God. Just give it to God. And you want to choke them, yes? <laughs> right. Um, just give it to God. What does that mean, just give it to God? Um, so I had to look it up in the Greek. It didn't help, but I'll tell you what I found out. <laughs> Aperipto is the, uh, is the word, aperipto. Um, you feel better? It's aperipto. Um, to th to th it means to throw or to cast upon, to take something and to throw it, to cast it upon something or someone else. And so Peter comes in and says, you've got all your cares. You've got all your worries. You've got all your fears. You've got all your agony in this life. You're meant to cast it upon God. Oh, what does that mean? So here's my best understanding as I've meditated on this. Um, so let's say you have um, a problem. Let's say you've got like appendicitis, for instance. You can't fix that on your own. Imagine if the scalpel was in your hand. That's a bad day, right? That's a bad day. So what do you do? You give, you surrender your problem, your need to a surgeon, to a good surgeon. Here you go. Right? It's, a, it's a better picture if the scalpel is in your hand and I'm going to go to bed at night sleeping better knowing that you're the one with the knowledge to take care of me. 
And so that giving, that surrender is important. Does it mean I'm not going to feel any more pain? Of course, I'm still going to feel pain. I'm still along for the ride. And he may still give me some things to do in my recovery. Absolutely. But it's essential that the scalpel's not in my hand. So Peter is saying, hey, give it to God. And what am I doing when I give him my grief over my father is I'm saying, I trust you. I trust you to walk me through however long this is going to last. I trust you. Please heal me. I trust you. I'm going to cry the tears even though I feel out of control because I trust you. I'm going to allow. I'm going to allow other people in. I'm not going to distract. I'm not going to deny. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to trust you. Easier said than done. Um, Academy Sports here in town. They have a fishing section. That's important. Remember that? Um, Fishing sections are important. Um, Why is that important? Because a little bit of history about Farrell Trueblood and myself, my dad and I, back when I was 16 years old, there was a fishing trip. For whatever blockhead reason, he decided not to take me on the fishing trip. He took some other people, did not take me, probably had to do with my age and some different things like that. I was so angry at him, I didn't speak to him for about a year and a half. I might have spoken to him on Christmas Day, but it was bad. I hold grudges. Yeah. Um, so it was bad. And uh, so anyway, we, we kind of got back together later on. Uh, forgiveness, healing, stuff like that. Um, and we slowly became friends. I never told him about the whole fishing trip thing until much later in life, and and Jake was coming up into his teens, and all of a sudden, he had the idea of a fishing trip, and all this uh, came out between me and dad, and I'm telling him about that brokenness, and he responds by wanting a fishing trip every single year from that point forward because he's trying to heal and trying to repair. What a beautiful thing, right? So Jake and I are going to this fishing trip. We would go to Wisconsin for a week, and they had the crappie spawn up there, and and we're doing the whole thing, and um, it was a great time, made all kinds of great memories. But usually down here in Oklahoma, as we're approaching May, which is when the spawn was, I'm at Academy Sports in the fishing section with my dad on the phone saying, what lures do I get this year? And what supplies do we need? And it's this big, fun conversation between me and him. So after he dies, the very first time I'm in Academy Sports and I'm not thinking about it, and I walk past the fishing section, it crushes me. I couldn't handle it. Because it all came back. And he's not there. And I can hear his voice. And what do you do with that? And I wasn't ready to face anything or to, tr- to cry the tears that God had for me. So I ran for it. And that was kind of stage one. Stage two is I spent months and months never going back to academy sports and avoiding all fishing sections everywhere. Because I didn't want to drive into it intentionally. I didn't, I didn't know how. <clears throat> Stage three, I remember getting to a point, might have been a year, year and a half later, um, where I could go there and it wasn't debilitating. And I could handle the tears that were there and the sadness that was there. And I was starting to understand it. And stage four came along later on. And it was a really weird thing and it surprised me and I never knew it was coming But there got to a point where I'd go into that store and I'd go near that fishing section and there was a weird joy that came. A joy mixed with pain, by the way. Weird, joyful pain cocktail thing that I was starting to feel. And like I said, that came a long time later and and the, the joy part that I was starting to feel is like, I'm glad somebody in the world is feeling this. I'm glad feral true blood didn't disappear off the face of the planet and nobody cared. I'm glad it was somebody's job 
to feel the loss of him around. Don't we wonder that sometimes? If I got hit by a truck tomorrow, would anybody care? Dark thoughts, aren't they? But they're still part of us. All we want is we want to be connected to other human beings so much that we're family and that we'd be missed if we were gone. And I know there's a really dark version of that. But there was beauty in missing him. I'm called by God. It's part of my job. I'm one of those blessed ones that will keep remembering this guy. And I think there's beauty in it. Psalm 56, 8 says, You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? This is King David writing in the Psalms. And I love his picture here. He says, every time I'm tossing at night over my worries and fears and struggles, God's there. He sees it. And every time I cry, God takes the tears and puts them in his bottle. <laughs> Why? Why would he do that? Um, he does it because you keep track of what matters, right? Like your kid gets the little, um, they get the little trophy. They didn't do anything. They just showed up, but you got the little trophy and you've still got it in a box. Why? Decades later, you've still got it in a box because it matters. It's part of their world. It matters to you. Like love letters that she wrote to you, you've still got them in your drawer at home. Why? Because it matters to you. We, we keep the things, we, we capture the things that matter to us. And so God comes and steps into that idea and says, every time you weep, I capture your tears because it matters. Not only am I there, not only do I care, but it's a moment. Do you love that God loves you that much? I want you guys stand. There's all kinds of reasons why we don't let ourselves emote and weep. Sometimes it makes us feel out of control. It makes us feel weak, and we struggle with that idea. Let that go. But sometimes the reason that we don't emote like that is because we don't realize the beauty that's there. See, God designed it. He designed you that way. I was reading this this week. Um, I've got to look this quote up. Because um, I read it, and then it was out of my mind. Charles Darwin just talking about species, right, and the way that we work. And he was talking about tears, and he was like, you know, beyond just lubricating eyeballs, there's no purpose whatsoever in a human being crying. Animals cry when they get hurt, but human beings are weird. All we have to do is feel something, and we'll weep. And there's no scientific reason for it. He was so wrong. He was so wrong. There's beauty. There's great beauty. Your God is a great designer. And he made you well from the ground up. He built you to be able to do this with way more beauty than you ever would have dreamed. He built you to heal along a road of weeping, along with other people who love you and carry the burden along with you. The light of Christ is in us. Do you know that? The baby born in Bethlehem came to heal us. So here's what we're going to do. Because I think we remember best the things that we do, not just the things that we hear. So I want you to do something today. So in your program, they gave you these little sheets of paper. And then somebody sat down and, like, made them really fancy. Um, and I love that. So take the pen that's in the chair in front of you. And what I want you to do is I want you to write the name of the person that you were called to miss. That you've got that crazy cocktail of, of joy and pain about. 
And maybe it's not a person that died. Maybe it is that family. Maybe it is that cancer. Maybe it is that old life that you used to have. And I just want you to write it on this paper. And we're going to cast it to the Lord. Uh, We're going to give it to him. We're going to surrender it to him. And so what we've got is we've got these tables in the back two corners of the room. And um, they've got candles on them. And they've got a little jar in the center to symbolize that this is what God is capturing from us. And so I'm just going to give you a chance to write that on there. And there's, there's prayer teams that are going to be in the back also. And, and we're going to have ushers with a basket with these cards in there because maybe you need to write two or three more of these before you leave this morning. Um, our prayer team has promised me that they're going to go through all these cards individually this week. They're going to pray over them. And they're going to pray for you. Isn't that good? So... Pastor Tanner is going to lead us in a beautiful song this morning, but we're not going to put the words up. We just want you to let this wash over you, enter into this time, be in this time. Let me pray. Oh, great God, great, beautiful, loving Father. The scripture says even the Holy Spirit grieves our grief is not a mistake. It's part of the divine, part of the divine nature. You've called us to walk in it. So Lord, I pray for a spirit of healing all across this room. God, wherever, wherever the wounds are, where all the wounds are, God, I pray that you would bring healing to them. God, aren't you good? God, we owe you our love, but days like today, God, it's easy to love you. You're so good. Jesus, come into our lives. Walk us through our next step. Come into our families. Bring healing, God. During the holidays, during Christmas, God, bring healing. Thank you, Jesus, in Christ's name.